Good evening, ladies and germs. As Will said, my name is Dave Westenberg, and I am a microbiologist. I study microbes. And so the question you might first ask yourself is, what is a microbe? Microbes are basically designed as organisms that you need a microscope to see. And so let's take a microscopic look at our microbial world, thanks to my friends, the giant microbes here. So microbes would include organisms like bacteria, archaea, fungi like yeast, or penicillin. It could include protists like the paramecium, the algae, or these adorable little amoebas that come in all sorts of colors. So. Or it could be a virus. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about the microbial world and hopefully kind of change your perception of what microbes are all about. All right, so let's look at that word germ for a minute. Some people don't like to hear the word germ. It kind of has a negative connotation, think that it's something bad. So now before you go washing your hands, um, we're going to talk about a few things that hopefully will change that perception for you. Okay? So what is it about that word germ that scares people off? Okay? That introductory line there, good evening, ladies and germs, that's kind of equated back to the days of uh, Milton Berle, the early golden age of television. Milton thought that was kind of a, maybe a joke that microbes are something that we should be, you know, insulted by, and so maybe he, though, however, was just a little bit ahead of his time on what he was thinking. Because since that time, we've learned about the microbes that live in us and on us. We've learned how we're outnumbered by the microbes that live in and on us, what we call the microbiome. And so if we're outnumbered by these organisms, perhaps Uncle Millie was a little ahead of his time. Maybe we really are germs. So what is it about that word that gets people a little bit concerned? I myself embrace that term. To the local school kids, especially my daughter's classmates growing up, they probably thought, oh, germs, I'm the germ guy. I love going to softball games and soccer games, and parents would tap me on the shoulder and say, are you the germ guy? Because yeah, that's what the kids all told them about. So I figured I'm doing my job if they're all thinking about germs and they're thinking about me. So germs are a good thing, and hopefully we're going to relay that to, to you throughout this presentation. So. Again, let's look at the origins of why germ is something that people are concerned about. When I teach microbiology, I like to talk about the history of microbiology. And there's a period we call the golden age of microbiology, when people started learning about the connections between specific microbes and specific diseases. They learned about the causative agents of dreaded diseases like anthrax, tuberculosis, cholera, Diseases that were killing a lot of people this time period and discovering what the causes of the diseases was was very important in changing the health and wellness of society. But of course, what they called this was the germ theory of disease. So no wonder people think germ, disease. That's the natural way that people think about it. So how can we change that perception? Yes, it's important to understand that microbes are an agent of disease and we need to be careful and, and, and not expose ourselves to, to infectious agents, but we need to learn that microbes are much more than that, much more important to the, what's going on on our planet. So I gotta confess that I had a little bit of that conception myself. When I was an undergraduate student, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Of course, you can't major in pre-vet or pre-med or anything of like that. You have to actually get a degree in a real discipline. And so I chose microbiology and public health because I thought, oh, microbes get people sick or get animals sick, and so I'm going to learn all about those diseases that make my animals sick. Boy, was my mind blown when I took my first microbiology in class that learned that microbes are way more than disease. You know, sure, I learned about some of the important disease-causing microorganisms. I still have nightmares about that parasitology class I took as a sophomore. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I learned that there is much more to the microbial world than these diseases, that microbes are important for our health, for our wellness, and for the environment. So learning about the role of microorganisms in our planet, or maybe we should call it their planet, so what I'm going to do today is tell you a few stories about some really fascinating microorganisms that I'm interested in, and hopefully change your view of what the microbial world is all about. So let's start off with microbes in food. Now, you're probably first thinking of microbes in food. Oh, that's salmonella or E. coli, the organisms that get a lot of attention in the news. But I'm talking about microbes that actually make our food delicious. 
the micro is responsible for our break refreshments, our beer, our wine, some of the things like kombucha, kefir that you might have had for breakfast today. We have a lot of foods that we associate with microorganisms that are part of that food. How many of you had yogurt for breakfast? Not very many of you. Well, if you had yogurt for breakfast, I got a prize here for you. <laughs> These are the microbes you find in your foods. So next time you have your yogurt, you have your beer, you have your cheese, think about the microbes that are responsible for those foods. Now, I also want you to think about food in another way. It's really important to think about the cultural connection to these microorganisms. Think about every culture in our society that has some kind of fermented food that's a part of their culture, that's connected with that uh, part of the world, that we use microorganisms to preserve our foods. So it's a very important role that these microorganisms play to make food last a long time and, and prevent it. So we can find a lot of cultures where there are these fermented foods that are part of that society. So humans have been doing this for centuries. But realize that this is something that's going on for a lot longer than that out in the animal world. I recently learned about some studies about bees. Bees collect pollen, and when they take the pollen back to the hive, they bring that back and they get this nice, sweet uh, pollen mixture that they feed to their larvae. What keeps that food from spoiling? Turns out that that pollen provisions are fermented and prevents it from spoiling. So maybe that's why bees buzz. All right. Never mind. That's not what I was really excited about microbes, though. I mean, I love that connection to, the, to our foods, but I was really interested in the role of microbes and their incredible diversity. That's something that just blew my mind, the fact that there are microorganisms out there that are more distantly related to each other than the microbes that, that, than we are to plants and fungi. Now, that's an incredible thing to think about. Now, when I was an undergraduate student, this was a really exciting time because it was in the late 70s, early 80s, when we discovered that there was a whole new domain of life we called the archaea. And one of my prized possessions from this time period is a button made by the great Carl Woese, who discovered this idea that there are archaea out there. I still wear that button today. Um, I've had this thing for a long time. Um, but that's just what blew me away. I just fell in love with these exotic organisms that grew at high temperatures, high salt. They grew without any oxygen. Really incredible role that these microorganisms play in our environment. And so that's what really turned me on to microbiology. And so hopefully I can kind of turn you on a little bit to what microbes are all about. Okay. So I've gone from my undergraduate days where I thought microbes cause disease, it's going to hurt my animals, to realize that microbes are important for the animals. That it's microorganisms that allow cows to eat their grass and chew their cud because those microorganisms help them digest their food. A particular group of organisms we call methanogens. Now these methanogens are very important for the cow, but they're also very important for our environment. A few years ago, I had the fortune to be able to go to a microbial diversity course at Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And one of the things that we do early on, kind of a group bonding experience, is we go out and root around in the swamps of Woods Hole and stir up methane, swamp gas. Stir it up and you can collect it, what we call the Volta experiment. Take a little funnel, hold it in the water, stir it up, collect those gas bubbles, and then you can set it on fire. That's a pretty cool experience to do out in the swamps of Massachusetts. Get some interesting looks from the, from the people in the community. Um, the, students, the, the graduate students for this class wanted to go out in a real bang with this process. So they decided we're not going to use some puny funnel. We're going to use a trash bag. And I'll tell you, it was a very exciting experience. That was their Volta experiment. Right? So microbes play a key role in our environment with the cycling of the nutrients that we depend upon. A really cool thing that I've been doing since, since my early days was learning about something called the Winograski column, credited to Sergei Winograski, one of the great 19th century uh, microbiologists. He came up with this approach to isolate certain kinds of organisms in soil and in pond water, what we call phototrophic, light-loving bacteria. And so you can make these beautiful columns. These are some ones that I've made in my lab, and I think it probably is disturbing to my friends and family that every time I see a plastic bottle, a cylinder, or something. I think, wow, that could make a really cool Winograski column. So imagine my excitement when I was rooting around through our building uh, a little while ago and found that the chemical engineers had left behind some giant glass columns. You know, and with St. Patrick's Day coming around the corner, I couldn't help but make my own Winograski column. Okay. So again, microbes and their role in the cycling of our nutrients. 
in my own research lab, I like to study plants and microbes and how they work together. What I study is nitrogen-fixing bacteria called rhizobia that have a relationship with legumes. Now, you've probably heard of the concept of crop rotation, the idea of rotating from a leguminous crop to a wheat to corn, some other thing. So the legumes kind of replenish the soil. I got news for you. It's not the legumes that are replenishing the soil. It's the microbes. The microbes live in these plants. They fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, and they feed it to the plants. Here's an example. These are soybean plants in which the plants on the left were not provided access to microbes. They weren't given any nitrogen, so they're kind of stunted in their growth. The plants on the right have been given microbes. They grow in the plants, and so these plants grow much more healthy. So a very critical process in our environment. Microbes are the only biological organisms that can do this process. Okay? And so plants and microbes are very important to my own research interests, and I've had the fortune to work with colleagues here in environmental engineering at ST using plants and microbes for phytoremediation. And I have to tell the environmental engineers that it's not the plants, it's the microbes that are doing all the work, but the plants are an important part of the process. So, um, so we kind of keep that name, phytoremediation, to keep everybody happy. But microbes and plants can do a lot of great things for our environment. So I've given you a little connection between microbes and the cycling of elements in our environment. Let's talk about a little farther back in history. Let's think about the role of microorganisms in the environment that makes our planet accessible. It was these microorganisms, the cyanobacteria, two and a half billion years ago, when they started doing photosynthesis and releasing oxygen into the environment. These are the microbes. If it wasn't for them and producing oxygen for the environment, life as we know it would never have happened. And so we depend upon these organisms to provide the oxygen that allowed life to evolve on Earth. Now the plants have been displaced, but basically plants are just a vessel for these cyanobacteria and things we call the chloroplasts. So here's some microbes that play a critical role in our environment. Another really fascinating environment are these guys, the giant tube worms that we find at hydrothermal vent communities. When I was a graduate student, I had the real thrill of getting to meet one of my heroes, Colleen Cavanaugh, who discovered this community at the bottom of the ocean was based upon microbial life. These things are living at the deepest parts of the ocean. There's no light down there. There's no photosynthesis. And we all learned in school about plants as being the primary producers, that the basis of our life is light. These organisms get no life, yet they grow at these incredible densities. These can be, things can be two meters long. How do they live down there without any light? It turns out that there are microorganisms that live inside these animals that are taking the energy from the seawater and feed these animals. So incredible thing we call symbiosis that's allowing this to happen. Another really cool symbiotic relationship is these cute guys. This is a bobtail squid. Now these squid, have a symbiotic relationship with a bacterium that is bioluminescent. Now, you're probably familiar with bioluminescence when you look at fireflies. Okay, fireflies produce a little light, but that's the firefly itself. These squid produce light, but they don't make any light. It's bacteria that make the light for them. So these bacteria live in the light organ of these squid and allow them to produce light that they can use as camouflage. Now, we can also use these bioluminescent organisms for some fun stuff. Uh, I've got a great colleague, Dr. Mark Martin, uh, that has taught me about using uh, bioluminescent bacteria to do some artwork. And so this is some of his great work that he did at the last conference we attended together. So you can have a lot of fun with these things. But I want to step back and look at these squid for a second. And there was some great work done by some uh, great microbiologists, uh, Margaret McFall Nye and Ned Ruby, who have been studying these relationships for a long time. And what they discovered that really is, is taking things in a whole new direction is that they've realized the importance of these microbes in the development of the squid. Without these bacteria, the squid light organ doesn't develop properly. A lot of things go wrong if they don't have this microbe around them. Now make that connection to us. Do we develop properly if we don't have the right collection of microbes that are growing in us and on us? And so we're learning how important microorganisms are for the development of the animal, particularly us. So a lot of really cool things that we can learn from microorganisms and their role in society. So I hope through this presentation, I've given you a little bit of a context and understand how microbes rule our world. And the next time you're in a grocery store and you see all these antibacterial products and worry about all these kinds of things, I dare you to consider, what would life be like without the microbes? Thank you.